Now, some of you are watching online right now, and you are watching because of the magic of a sensor. Uh, those of you that don't know, this is Shane back here, by the way. Big thanks to Shane for, for not only keeping us in frame, but he also does the edits to our videos and then sends it to us, and he's been such a blessing. The way a camera works is it's got a sensor inside, right? And what does the sensor capture? Light. The sensor captures light. And so that is the way in which you online right now are seeing me is because we have a bunch of lights and you're getting the light reflecting off of me into the sensor of the camera and that's capturing the image. That is something like the believer in Christ. There's something of being like the sensor in a camera. We are capturing light, his light in us. And out of that, we can replay to the world new values, new ways of living. We show the world something different because of the light of the world in us. Amen? So today we want to talk about Jesus, the light of the world. Now, if you know Lisa at all, and you've had opportunity to kind of hang around her for a little bit, you will know that Lisa loves looking at the stars. In fact, this last week, there was one particular night I was driving home and I saw the sky just as clear as day. And so I got home. I didn't tell Lisa what was happening. I just grabbed a blanket. I threw it over her shoulders. I said, come with me. And we went out onto our deck and we looked up at the sky because I knew that she wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to see the stars. And they're beautiful. Powell River, we have a very rare opportunity to see the night sky in the way that much of the world doesn't get to see it, especially in our Western world. It's beautiful. There's so much going on. And of course, Lisa, she has this phone app. And you point it to the sky, and it shows you all of the constellations. It shows you all of the planets. It kind of shows you everything that's going on in the night sky. Beautiful. So much going on. Now let's pause this moment, 21st century. Let's go back. Let's rewind into the first century, about 0 A.D., I want you to consider the night sky then. There would have been very little light pollution from humanity interfering with our view of the night sky. There would have been much more mystery when it came to the night sky. They wouldn't have had a nice little app to just point up and see everything that's going on and what's what. But in that first century, there were people who made it their job to study the sky. And we're going to dig into who these people are today. Who's heard of the Magi before? The Magi. Okay, let me use a different terminology because you might understand this. The wise men. When it comes to Christmas, who's heard of the wise men? Right? Typically in a nativity scene, we see what? Three wise men. We sing... The song, We Three Kings, right? Now, just spoiler alert, we don't know if it was three kings or three magi or if it was many, many more. It was at least two. We know that. It was at least two. But we only say it's three kings because there's three gifts. That doesn't necessarily mean there's only three of them. But there was something in the night sky that appeared in the first century that caused these people... To get up from the, where they were, and they traveled over 2,700 kilometers to visit who they believed was a king come to earth. This is, this is no small feat. This is no small thing. This would have taken anywhere from four to six months, depending on how big the party was that traveled to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, that first Christmas. That first Christmas season, and by season we mean a span of about two years. 
We'll get into that in a sec. Most likely, these were Persians from Babylon. All right, Persians from Babylon. And one night they saw something that caused them to take this journey. So what sparked this journey? What sparked their conviction, their belief that they were heading out to find a king? Why in the world would these people think, we're going to travel four to six months and we're going to find a king? Why? Like what sparked that? What started? What was the catalyst for that? That belief and that trek? And today we're going to explore Jesus known as the light of the world. So we're going to dig into this. So Lord, as we dig into your word, as we dig into the narrative, the historical narrative of your coming to earth as Emmanuel, God with us. Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. You might remember this from our series in John. And Jesus is referring to himself as the light of the world. Now, he's not doing this in a vacuum. Sometimes we can read this and we can think in terms of how do we interpret what Jesus means by this? And if we just use this in isolation, we might think, you know what, maybe he's saying, I I am the light of the world. I bring a revelation to the world. And then we might treat Jesus as like a prophet. Or we might think, I am the light of the world. Like, I am modeling and representing what life should look like. Then we just see Jesus as some kind of a guru. A rabbi to be imitated. To find success and life. But this wasn't written, and he didn't say this in a vacuum. He said this because he is hearkening back to the Old Testament, and the promises that were made there. In saying this, Jesus is literally saying, I am God. Let me prove it to you. In order to understand what's happening here, we have to go back roughly 740 years to Isaiah. But first, a little bit of context. Isaiah has been prophesying about the role of Israel in the history of the world. He's been prophesying about what their their role is and what God has kind of ordained them to do in the world. And it's a role that involves revealing God to the world around them. In fact, in chapters 40 to 48, we see this idea. And these are what many call the servant songs. The servant songs. They were meant to serve the humanity around them representing Yahweh to the world, reflecting the light of God to the nations around them. But in chapter 49, Isaiah, he kind of switches gears in a big way. And he starts talking in the singular. He starts talking about one individual, one person, So instead of the collective, he now begins to talk about the person. Who is the person? The servant songs are referring to. In in chapter 49, verse 6, it says, he says, this is God saying in, in reference to his servant through Isaiah, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob. And bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. That Man, guys, come on. There's so much promise in this verse. There's so much hope in this verse. He says the mission is just too small. Just to restore Judah 
and Israel. No, the light of the Messiah will shine over the entire earth to all nations. It'll penetrate the darkness to the ends of the earth. This is so exciting. And here we see the magnitude and we begin to understand fully the mission of the Messiah in the world. And so when Jesus stands in the first century and he says, I am the light of the world, he's hearkening back to the promise of Isaiah. I will be light to all nations and all mankind. So what does this all have to do with the Christmas narrative? Well, this is kind of just the setup. We needed to understand the dynamics and to appreciate kind of this motif and this metaphor to finally kind of get the implications of the Christmas historical narrative. Now, I have to warn you, I geeked out a little bit this week. I geeked out a little bit, and you know what that means. You're going to have to get a little nerdy with me. Is that okay? Can you get a little nerdy with me? Because it was kind of pretty cool. In my research, I was kind of getting kind of excited because there's so much going on here. There's so many implications to the symbolism and to the metaphor and to the motif of light as we see Emmanuel, God with us, the light of the world come in to this place. So there's so many ways that we see God announce and introduce Jesus to the world. In the Christmas narrative, we see that he, he does it through the appearing of angels to people. He does it through this grand choir of angels in the night sky as they bring glad tidings of great joy to the shepherds in their fields. But there's one other way that Jesus is announced to the world. It's a symbol. It happened in the night sky. What was it? A star. You might call it the, the Christmas star. We know that there was a star because Matthew writes of it. And with the appearance of the star, magi in the east, most likely Persians, are convinced that it's the sign of a newborn king. Why might this be? Well, if you remember Israel's history, you know that Israel, previous to this moment, was in captivity in Babylon. Under the Assyrians, right? You remember that? We talked about this a little a few weeks ago, actually. We referenced this. Who remembers a guy by the name of Daniel? You might know him better by his moniker, Daniel in the lion's den. This man that was faithful to God and he rose to prominence in the Assyrian Babylonian kingdom. And he brought the ways of Yahweh to that kingdom. The writings, the history, the oral traditions of the stories of Yahweh. And so these men, as they're studying the night sky, and, and they're, they're doing it both scientifically and sort of spiritually. This is, this is like one part science, two parts kind of astrology. Okay? But they see a sign in the skies and they're convinced that it is a newborn king. Why? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, is because they had access to something like Numbers, chapter 24 or 17. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. So let me ask you, what is a star? What is a star? A star is defined as any massive, self-luminous, celestial body of gas that shines by radiation derived from its in internal energy sources. What does a star produce? Light. It produces light. That's why we can see the stars. You see these motifs kind of coming together? There are many theories as to what the star that appeared in the first century was. There's, there's quite a few theories. The word for star in the Greek is aster, which is where we get our English word astronomy. Now, unlike today, this could reference, in that time, when they use that word aster in the Greek, it could reference any source of light in the sky. Any source of light in the sky. 
So this could include celestial kind of moments, supernovas, comets, planets, and stars. So there's some common theories around the Christmas star that we read about in the narrative through Matthew. One theory is that it was a supernova. Okay, so this is a theory. It's a supernova. The lighting effects of a supernova would remain in the sky and, and for several months. It's a spectacular sight. The problem with this theory is it seems like the wise men, the magi, these specialists in the sky, are the only ones that noticed it. Because the narrative talks about they go to Jerusalem and they say, where is this king born of the Jews, right? And Herod goes, what are you talking about? And he brings in all his counsel and his wise men and his... And they, they just seem to not know what they're talking about. What do you mean by this? And so in the narrative, we kind of go, if this is a supernova, I think more people would have seen it and, and understood to some degree that it was there in the night sky. So another theory is it was a comet. But the description of the star coming to rest over the place where Jesus dwelt doesn't fit with that kind of narrative that Matthew gives us. It also doesn't fit the fact that these wise men saw this star twice. We don't know if they were guided by the star necessarily, but we do know at very least they saw it twice, right? They saw it in the east, which sparked their journey to Jerusalem. And then they saw it again as they went to Bethlehem, and they saw it come to rest over the place that Jesus dwelt. So comment doesn't fully fit this. So the third theory, if we're kind of strictly talking natural law, would be a conjunction. Now, a conjunction is where a planet passes closely by a star or another planet. And so as they do, there's a sense of brightness that comes as we see it from the earth. So was it a conjunction? I want to read you an excerpt from an article entitled, What Was the Christmas Star? by Dr. Jason Lyle. It says this, But there was one, and only one, extraordinary conjunction around the time of Christ's birth that could be called a star. In the year 2 BC, Jupiter and Venus moved so close to each other that they briefly appeared to merge into a single bright star. Such an event is extremely rare and may have been perceived as highly significant to the Magi. Although this event would have been really spectacular, it does not fully match the description of the Christmas star. The careful reading of the biblical text indicates that the Magi saw the star on at least two occasions, when they arrived at Jerusalem and after meeting with Herod. But the merging of Jupiter and Venus happened only once on the evening of June 17, 2 BC. Okay. Was it a conjunction? Maybe. But it doesn't quite fit the narrative. I told you I'm going to geek out with you guys. So in many ways, we've kind of exhausted our explanations under natural law of what the Christmas star was. So what are we left with? What are we left with? The supernatural, right? The supernatural. We know God can do all things. We know in history, we've seen in the Old Testament, he stopped the sun in the sky, the rotation of the earth. I mean, that was miraculous. That was unbelievable. God can do what he wants to do. So keep in mind that this announcement of, this, of a supernatural event, the incarnation of Jesus, born of a virgin, immaculate conception, there is the supernatural all through the Christmas narrative. So what are the clues that might lead us to believe this is a supernatural sign in the heavens using light to reveal the light? In Matthew 2, verse 2, we read, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
take a moment to think this through now. Let's, let's kind of put on our thinking hats for a second. Wise men from, from the east saw a star rise. And so they traveled which way? To get to Jerusalem. West. Wise men from the east saw a star, and then they got up and traveled west. This gives you a bit of a picture of what's happening. This is about 2,700 kilometers between Jerusalem and the Persian Gulf, Babylon kind of area in the Persian Empire. What is the problem we face with this narrative from Matthew? You see, due to the rotation of the earth, stars rise in the east. So how does this make any sense? That they saw a star rise and they traveled west. I'm going to put it to you that perhaps God in his sovereignty, bringing the announcement of Jesus to the world, caused a star to rise contrary to natural law in the West. And these magi, because they were specialists in understanding the night sky, they saw this phenomenon and went, that's impossible. That's absolutely impossible. That has never happened. Conjunctions have happened before. Supernovas, we've seen those. Comets, we see those all the time. But we have never seen a star rise in the West. And when they saw that star, it caused something to spark in them. And I'm sure they went to ancient writings. And they went to all the different things that they had access to, to understand what in the world is going on. And what was west of them? Jacob. Judah. Israel. The house of Jacob. What did Numbers tell us? A star will rise over the house of Jacob. A scepter. And so they travel 2,700 kilometers to go and venerate a king come to earth. There's just something so spectacular about the Christmas narrative. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And I want to take a moment as we close with some extra time, friends, to consider just how much thought and detail God put into the coming of Jesus to the world. Like sometimes we we look, we've, we've so oversimplified the Christmas narrative Right? We all have our nativity site set up. We have, we have one made from olive wood that's from Israel, and it's set up in our kitchen in our little cupboard thing, and it's all nice and just tidy and cool. But we've so oversimplified everything that God put into that climax of the story of creation. Jesus come to earth. And we find ourselves in the season of Advent, This moment of preparing and preparation for what God would have for us this Christmas season. And you might be looking at this and going, okay, that was really cool. Those are kind of some neat kind of things, some neat ideas. Like, what does that have to do with me? Like, why does it matter? Why does it matter that there was a star? Why does it matter that wise men went to seek him. Why does it matter that God potentially used the supernatural to reveal Jesus to the world? A supernatural event. Why should I care? I want to convince you of two primary reasons you should care this Christmas season. Number one, the cohesion of the Old Testament describing the coming Messiah 
and the fulfillment of those events in Jesus of Nazareth is hard to argue against. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, both his coming and his teaching and in his death and resurrection. Perfectly. Without flaw. Every detail. Every I dotted. Every T crossed. An impossibility. An absolute, imp like statistical impossibility. Yet it fulfilled in Jesus. Because he is God. He's God. I don't know if you're here and you're exploring faith, or maybe you're here and you've been kind of wrestling with your own faith. But let, let, let me convince you, and may the Spirit convince you today, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. We spoke of it before. We see roughly 320 plus prophecies and signs written and described, fulfilled in Jesus. The second reason we should care, the light revealed in part by the light of that star was not just for Israel, but that light would penetrate the darkness of the entire world. For many of you here today, that light penetrated the darkness in your own soul. You had a revelation of this Jesus promise, Emmanuel, God with us, and he changed everything. That light reaches you today in this moment. And I don't know what your journey looks like. I don't know what your life looks like. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. But I'm convinced that Jesus is God. And I'm convinced that he's the light of the world. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And some of you have been seeking, you've been seeking so desperately in this world for some semblance of truth, some semblance of objective truth that you can just hitch your wagon to and just finally settle into a conviction that causes you to be free. And you've looked in so many places, you've looked within yourself, you've looked within your own experiences, you've looked within your own hopes and dreams. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of the journey. It's not until we dig into ourselves and then we just keep on coming up lacking. That we begin to be convinced that there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. I put it to you today, that something more is Jesus. The light of the world. And his light is reaching you right now in this moment by his spirit. Being revealed to you. And I pray that this Christmas season, you would capture that light in your heart. As you just simply let your soul be laid bare before him. I've sought truth, I've sought life, I've sought joy, I've sought peace in so many places. But there's a star that's rising in the West. Contrary to everything I know, That light is for you, and it reveals Jesus. It comes to rest over Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. My name is Lucas, if we haven't met. Do you know what Lucas means? Or Luke, the apostle, from the New Testament? Lucas, or Luke, means bearer of light. Friends, we are all bearers of light. 
In this Christmas season, we have opportunity to be a city on the hill that cannot be hidden. We have opportunity to be just like, just like that Christmas star that rose that first Christmas and caused a bunch of pagan men from the east to seek out the king. Don't underestimate the light of Christ in you as you live out the gospel and his truth in this world. You are that Christmas star for someone. So shine bright. So shine bright. Holy Spirit, would you spark something in us today? Would you cause us to understand that the light of the world has come to dwell within us? For those exploring faith, Holy Spirit, may your light, may the light of Christ penetrate hearts and minds today. Those watching online, may they just have an encounter with Jesus today. By your Spirit, that they might know the life and the peace and the joy that you have for each and every one of them. So this Christmas season, as we prepare our hearts, as we walk through this moment of Advent, reveal the light, both in us and then through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.